Hi, my name is Shan Boudram. I'm 37 years old, and for the past 15 years, I have been working as a public-facing sex and relationship educator whose mission is to help people become more competent and thus more confident in their ability to build meaningful, intimate connections. And I am also someone who doesn't really have friends. I'm 23 years old. I'm 25 years old. I'm 25 years old. I'm 26 years old. I'm 30 years old. I'm 32 years old. I'm 37 years old. I have a small black owned business. I am in school for Tantra. I live nomadically. I recently landed my dream job, married the love of my life. I'm pursuing my dreams on my self-development journey. I'm a good ass host. I have been pursuing higher education. I could probably go to almost any event and find someone that I know. And I don't, I don't really, really have, have friends. friends. And I don't really have a lot of friends. And I don't really have any friends. I feel like I don't really have any friends. Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. I'ma take you on a trip, baby, I don't pretend, I said Lovers and friends, uh, I'ma hold you down, down to the end, I said <laughs> okay, Hi, cool. lovers and friends! <laughs> hey, how's it going? That's actually, I was talking to them, Camille. Oh, okay. But that. that was a weird moment where, you know, when you're waving <laughs> and then somebody waves back and you're like, oh, it was a person like... behind you I was waving to. But um, let me say it to you. Hi, lover. Hi, friend. Hey, hi. how's it going? Which actually is an interesting thing because I think we're figuring out the friendship and maybe yeah. lover part of our relationship. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I'm here for it. I'm here for all of it. <laughs> hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. It's just me and you for a second. Because before we get into the conversation with Camille and the other amazing women that I have on this podcast, I want to give us a lay of the land. And that comes with a short backstory. I've been working on this episode since January. And when I started it in January, it began with the question, how do I make friends in my 30s? And as time has evolved, because now we are in early March, the question has morphed into, do I need meaningful friends in my 30s or in particular in this time in my life? And if those questions ring true for you, then I made this episode for us. And in order for me to answer this question, I invited on, and like I said, a multitude of guests. And after I really put things together, I realized what I've done is create my own Christmas Carol story. Tonight, you will not sleep. Hey, you. Who are you? The ghost of to inspect your heart and soul. So in this episode, you're going to hear from Camille Lewis and Danielle Bayer, the experts on this episode, whom are like my ghosts of Christmas future, as they challenge me to think about what I really want going forward. Then we have Almost 30 podcast host Krista Williams, aka my ghost of Christmas present, who helps me to see where I'm at by sharing vulnerably where she is at with her friendships, for better or worse. And lastly, I invited Olympian Tabia Charles, AKA my ex best friend, AKA a current professional friend maker, AKA my ghost of Christmas past, who really holds a mirror up to me and anyone who feels similarly left out of the BFF heaven club. Now my ghosts don't visit me in the exact order that you're used to. And that is why in the end, I'm gonna pop back in to really tell you what all of this means and to share a personally shocking discovery that I made through this episode. Until then, back to Camille, our ghost of Christmas present. Camille is a therapist. Absolutely. Now you specialize in sex and relationships, yeah. but if you expand it on the relationships aspect, what does yeah. your work mostly speak to? My approach to therapy is so relational in its basis and foundation because it is just how I experience humanity. It's the most important part of being human is our connection and our relationships. So a lot of my work, while it might focus on romantic or sexual partnership, it also explores community, platonic friendship. Now, what I love about this podcast is that often I start with an, a thought or an idea for an episode. And by the time I'm finished making it, I feel completely different. Yeah. And this is one of those episodes where I started this because at the top of the year, I said, this is a little embarrassing to admit. What I can't do right now that I really, really want to be able to do is say, I'm going to hang out with my friend tonight. Not because I don't have the time, but because I don't really have a friend like that. I have my sister, of course, and I love my sister. I'm not discounting that relationship. I have my husband. I'm not discounting those relationships. But a genuine friend who's not related to me or doesn't have sex with me that 
we just have a really great vibe and hang out and they're the release that I need. I don't really have that friend and I really would like one like that. This topic in particular is one of the most requested mm. amongst my community. Mm. Why would you say that it is out of gut instinct? I think that that speaks to the desire for connection in a way that people want to feel palpable. And I think that a lot of people want exact, precise steps for a lot of things. And I think that when we talk about sex and we talk about romantic relationships, there's a lot of maybe more suggestions and studies and things that we can pull from. But friendships were just like, you just like have them and they happen and then you, they just manifest throughout the rest of your life when that's actually not the case. They need a lot of attention and nurturing and there's not this step-by-step -step kind of process. And so I think maybe folks are looking for that. And along that note, so Danielle Byard, who is Bumble's friendship expert, reached out to me and said, we both work with Bumble because I work on their sex relationship side. Um, I would love to be a podcast guest if you ever have an episode coming up about friendships. And I said, well, look, I do have one coming up and I would love to hear your reflections on starting meaningful friendships in your adult years. Love and that. here's what she had to say. My name is Danielle Byer Jackson. I am a friendship coach and educator, the host of the Friend Forward podcast, and the resident friendship expert at Bumble BFF. I am so glad that we're dedicating time here to talk about the importance of women's friendships because when you look at what the research says about this specific bond, you realize pretty quickly that we should be talking about this more often. Harvard's conducted the longest study on happiness, and they found that the number one determining factor of your overall life satisfaction and well-being is the quality of your relationships. Yet the new American Time Use Survey finds that we're spending less time with our friends than ever before. Ten years ago, we spent on average about six hours a week, but that has dwindled down to a little over two. And that trend started years before the pandemic. So it makes you wonder, if we're engaging less with these kinds of relationships, what's the overall impact? Especially considering the fact that there are mountains of research that draw a direct line between our friendships and the impact that they have on our physical, mental, and emotional health. When women are distressed and they come together to seek refuge, their cortisol, the stress hormone, decreases and their oxytocin increases. People with larger, stronger social networks are happier than those who don't have them. Out of more than 100 factors that influence depression, having somebody to talk to is number one. And women who have mostly female-dominated circles are more successful at work than those who don't have them. When you hear the range of holistic benefits of having good friendships, you can't help but to look at your own friendship landscape in an effort to figure out how to create and sustain healthier friendships. Because women's friendships are about so much more than going to brunch. They are an absolute wellness imperative. According to the New York Times, there's three conditions that sociologists since the 50s have considered crucial to making friends. Okay. Proximity, mm -hmm. repeated unplanned interactions. Repeated unplanned interactions. Okay. That one hit me. Huh. I want to get your reflection on that one. Yeah. And then lastly, um, a setting that encourages people to let their guard down and confide in each other. Hmm. No, I think that the second one is just standing out to me. Repeated unplanned interactions. Yeah. Why I can see that is because it's like, I just called you. Okay. okay. I just reached out to mm -hmm. you. Like, mm -hmm. this is actually a big distinction for me because I have been saying yeah. in making of this episode, I don't have friends. And I'm also like acknowledging we just worked together recently yeah. and we're around a group of my friends. Yeah. So that's why it was surprising for me to hear you say that. Because and this is actually really helpful to me in the research for this. There's a difference between sentimental friends and mm -hmm. active friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of sentimental friendships yeah. that I have known them for a long time or we have yeah. a special place in each other's hearts. Or there was a time where we had a very active friendship. Yeah. But those aren't people who I think actively can say, here's what Shan's going through right now. Yeah. I love that you re like reframed that because now that I think of that, then that makes a lot of sense. Just somebody that you can call up and be like, what are you doing? Or call up when you're crying. Yeah. Call up and just be like, what are you doing right now? I need to see you. Or this is like something hilarious that I found on the, like those unplanned interactions, I definitely think help to cement a friendship when you can kind of just like call and talk about nothing exactly. with somebody. I'm really, I like those three points Me about too. friendship. I'm happy that you like them as well. Okay, I'm gonna throw some more things at you. Um, all right, so how long does it take to make a new friend? Hmm. Study show, 50 hours of time before you consider them a casual friend. 90 hours before becoming real friends. 200 before becoming close friends. This is from the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships. Huh. I think that what those numbers speak to, to me, sounds like safety. Like what you would feel comfortable talking 
with somebody with when you spent less time with them versus more time and where you feel like somebody's values are. I think like values exploration can come through spending more time with somebody because you could be like, is this person going to be on the same page with this thing that I really value or not? And my vulnerabilities and like, what are the places that I feel really tender and really need support on? And is that person able to offer those things? So learning the nuances of somebody's personality, I think, just naturally does take time for sure. Yeah, I think that that aspect of like, there's a difference between giving infinite resources. Like I can give infinite love. I can give infinite like. I can give infinite like sentimental care Mm -hmm. and finite resources. Yeah. My time. Yeah. My money. Yeah. My ear. Yeah. So yes, I think a lot of people in terms of sentimental friends, we have a lot of space. I came up against this a lot when I had two kids where I found one of the great myths was that people said like, oh, you'll just realize that your heart expands. Mm -hmm. Once you have two kids, like Mm -hmm. you don't think you could love anymore, but you can love more. I'm like, maybe I can love more, Yeah, but I can't play more. I can't, yeah. you know, give eye contact more. Absolutely. I can't, you know, there are finite resources within my day that make it so that I have to pick one or the other at different times. And yeah. so when you're asking a friend not just to, like, be there in theory, mm-hmm. but to actually show up for you. Yeah, it's kind of like the, like, you know I got you versus, like, you know, like, I got you. Yeah. You can know that person really will have your back in whatever situation. Because th- I've had two guests in this podcast, and both of them are friends. One of them is a new friend. Yeah. And I am somebody who is very slow to build friendships. Mm. And so it's interesting because when I read this hours list, like the person I have as my guest coming yeah. up first is Krista. Yeah. And I met Krista three years ago, mm. and we've probably had three interactions. Like, I'm very slow. Okay. So I'm like, God damn, if I got to get to 90 hours, <laughs> like, we're talking like 80 yeah, like, years old. We're like, decades. no, we're close <laughs> friends. Like, it takes a long time to for me to find those inroads of people. But and my other friend is somebody who was my childhood best friend. Yeah. So the other people on this podcast are rich and abundant in friendships. Yeah. Where would you say you are? I would say I would say I'm pretty rich and abundant in friendships in that I feel like I have developed I have when I reflect on my friendships, like I have some friends that I've known for years. And I also have some friends that are local here that I could call for anything and really I think help me feel sane. So I think that that is, I think that that's probably true for me. Like I really rely on my friendships and, and I value them. And I think that um, I put a lot of energy into them as well. I yeah. am glad that you said that, yeah. that you put a lot of energy into them. Yeah. Because that's what I would love to talk about with you. Yeah. We do our conclusion together. Absolutely. But until then, we want to talk about ZocDoc, who is the sponsor of this episode. And then we're going to talk to Krista and Tavia. Perfect. Um, and then we'll get back together. Amazing. You're not really leaving, but well. <laughs> in their world. <laughs> Bye, Camille. Bye. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> now I am thrilled to introduce you to the sponsor of this episode, ZocDoc, which is an incredible no-brainer. Why did I not think of that service that just makes life easier and more optimal. ZocDoc is a free app that shows you doctors who are patient reviewed, doctors who take your insurance, and most importantly, doctors who are available when you need an appointment. With ZocDoc, you can see real verified patient reviews to help you find the right doctor in your network and your neighborhood. And when you think about that, this is already what we're doing already in everything else in life. We need something, we go online, we do our research, we read reviews, and we make an informed decision. So why not do the same thing when it comes to your health and wellness, an area where you deserve the best and only you know what best means to you. So with ZocDoc, it's really as simple as, again, any other service that you already intuitively use on your phone. You go, you search, you read, you choose someone, and then you decide how to book an appointment. They can do remote, they can do in person. Again, it's really about what's best for you. And right now, your girl's feet are acting a little funky, so I'm using ZocDoc to find myself a fresh podiatrist for my funky feet. So if you got something funky in your life or you want to keep fresh, go to ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc.com. <laughs> Anybody else trying to do that 10 times fast, go to ZocDoc.com slash lovers and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then start your search for a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. ZocDoc.com slash lovers. 
Action, baby. Hi, friend. Hey, friend. I thought of you for this episode because I'm like, I'm, I really like Krista. I love you. I really love you. I remember one time you said you were talking to your sister and she was like, who would you want to like, I don't know, she said something, who would you want to something with? And you're like, Krista. And then I'm like, I've seen Krista twice in my I life. I literally was like, <laughs> dude, honestly, I was like, no, but I, it's so weird how, but this is the thing with friends and I'm so glad we're talking about it because you can just have that with someone and I just appreciate you so much. And that's the thing with friendships is it's so much related to romantic relationships because it's all about connection. And it's like, how are we now seeing our friends as our chosen family, which is really important. I think they're so undervalued and I think they're so important. I mean, especially as women, you know, our brains are wired for connection. I think humans' brains are wired for connection. And I think when I think about my life, like some of my biggest heartbreaks have been with friends. Some, yes, you know girl. what I mean? Yes. I just had a dream the other night, like two nights ago, about this friend that I had a friendship breakup with in college. And it's like a relationship that I really loved and really cared about. And I think when we think about our lives, we often think about the prioritization of our romantic relationships as like the ones, you know, that got away. Or we think about, I'm like, no, I think about friends all the time. I think about my relationships of people that I'm with and friends are your amplifiers. You know, my friend Mel Robbins often talks about that. It's like, Whoever you're around, they, that's why they say, you know, you are the five people you surround yourself with. That was a great LA moment, by the way. I know. What, my friend? My friend, my friend Mel Robbins. Is that, is that a flex? Yeah, it's a I huge flex. I just wanted to give her credit. Yeah. I just wanted to give her credit. Like my homegirl, Big O. Yeah, And, yo. you know, anyway, so I was at her fifth house. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, and that's another thing where you say friend, and it's like, me and Mel are really cool, but I don't know if we're, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's an interesting part. If of, she was on this podcast right now and brought you up, would she say my friend Krista or would she say this, this podcaster? <laughs> <laughs> yes, she would. Yes, she would say friends. <laughs> this person I've helped. No, I'm like, she would say friends. <laughs> like, she'd definitely say friends. Um, no, but I think they're just such important aspects to my life. Like I've learned so much in my relationships and my friendships. So how can we focus on our friends as an important part of amplifying the person that we want to be supporting ourselves in our dreams and really being mentally well and feeling whole and connected. And my relationships have been really challenging and difficult through the years, but also something that's been incredibly healing for me. You know, Lindsay is an example. She's my best friend and podcast co-host. And um, our relationship has just transformed me in so many ways because she's been one of the first people in my life I've actually been able to say anything to. Yes. And not, and I, you do a really good job at allowing people to speak and not feel judged and really being heard. And she has that gift as well. You, I perceive, we're talking about this Instagram versus real life thing, but I do perceive you as somebody who is very abundant in friendships. Mm -hmm. True or false? True. Mm -hmm. well, I want to make sure everyone knows online. <laughs> so I post them all the time. <laughs> no, I, I um, yeah, I have a lot of very meaningful friendships. And I will say that which I can talk about how I cultivate those. But on the other end, it doesn't, it's not, I don't give up any, I have to give up things for it. So I don't have a family. You know, I don't have children. That's a lot. Those are your, that's everything. And I also think about how I don't think I prioritize my business and my purpose enough because there's been aspects of me that have actually been very codependent. And so the codependency actually caused me to be someone that sought out tons of relationships and friendships because that's how I felt validated and wanted. So that's something now that I'm sort of working on is like, how can I be in relationship with people and not be so codependent where like, if they're not responding to me or texting to me, I'm okay. And I realized for and you a while- you feel like right now you're not? Um, no, like I'll find my times just like, I'll find myself at times psychically just kind of thinking about things. If I haven't heard from someone in a few days, I'm like, maybe they're mad at me, that kind of thing. So it's, and I realized last year what I was doing is there was a few female relationships that I had in my life that I would focus on a lot. And I realized that they were relationships of women that I had really insecure attachments with and women that I really, really looked up to and almost idolized a little bit. And I would just think about them all the time. I'm like, I, you know, just about our relationship, scared they were mad at me or scared they didn't love me in the way that they love them. And what I realized I was doing is um, projecting sort of my mother onto them. And so what happens with the mother wound, which is something I've talked about on the podcast, is that we can oftentimes see any female relationship as a version of our mother 
as an aspect of ours that we need to heal. So I was looking at these women that were powerful, intimidating, someone I looked up to, and women that I had insecure attachments with, which is sort of like my mom. And I was just like wanting their attention, wanting their affection, really wanting them to love me. Oh, wow. I'm so blown away by this. And I actually love this point, though, too, because I think a lot of times attachment style gets pegged as a trait, like a astrological sign. You're a Taurus, you're secure, you're not. Because our relationship is so incredibly secure. Like I don't talk to you very often. Whenever we do have flow, we have a great time together and there's never any pressure for it to be anything more. And I never feel that hanging. So I don't have the space or capacity, I think, to be anxious within my friendships. And so I just assumed that you were the exact same way because that's our interaction. So it's kind of shocking for me to hear that there are some people that you don't have that same dynamic with. And it's wild because with Lindsay, <clears throat> we she used to be anxious with me and I was avoidant. And then I used to be, and then it, later on in our relationship, once I actually learned to trust her, because it takes me so long to actually trust people, took me probably four years to trust her, I became really anxious with her and she became really avoidant. So I think one of the things about having a lot of friends and learning to be a good friend and prioritizing relationships is like it does take a lot of work and it does take effort. And it is something where I'm really willing to put in that time to make sure that people love me as much as I love, or make sure and understand that people love me as much as I love them. Do you go to your friend? Like, how do you yeah. manage that within friendships? I'm curious what you do, but um, yeah, that one's a hard one. And that one's something I'm working with right now in my life. Like, how much do I communicate in my friendship relationships what's going on in my head? Because that's a lot of trust. Like, yes. that is actual vulnerability to take the risk of being like, this is weird and could be scary and I could be completely off or I could be totally like invested in this more than you are and I could see more from this relationship than you do and I could see less, whatever. And actually sharing what's going on in your head is like such a risk. So that is something I do with only a few friends. You know, I've established relationships where I'm going out of my way to make sure that we have the foundational trust to say how we feel. Um, an example would be with Lindsay, we have to travel for our podcast. So Lindsay lives in Brooklyn, New York, and I live in Los Angeles now. And um, she was planning a trip. It was probably a year ago. And she's like, I'm just feeling really resistant to come like and travel. I just don't want to travel right now. For some reason, that just triggered me. Like it just really was like, she doesn't want to see me. She doesn't want to invest in almost 30. She doesn't, doesn't want to, you know, be with me, blah, blah, blah. And I just was, got super triggered. I was super upset. And you know, in that situation, I was just like, hey, I'm super triggered by what you said. I'm really upset and I'm just feeling really anxious. Like, I'd love to talk about this tomorrow. So we always make sure to like take space and um, give ourselves time. And then whenever we have conversations, if we do, so whenever you're having conversations with a best friend or one of your friends, if you're going to be honest with them, making sure to really take responsibility and process before. So a lot of times with friends, I think a lot of friendships would break up because they're like, you know, you don't even care about almost 30. You don't even want to come. You don't care about me. And instead of doing that, I'm like, huh, what's happening here? I'm actually feeling incredibly anxious. I'm thinking she doesn't care about almost 30. I'm thinking she doesn't want to see me. And I'm feeling really upset and hurt by that. So instead of being like, you, 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 the I, I, I. So we'd have a conversation like, and I'm like, hey, it really upsets me, you know, that you don't want to come. I feel like you're not prioritizing our relationship. And she can come in the same way. And that has really built this really beautiful space where we are allowed to be open. But I actually have not really had a lot of situations and circumstances with women, especially where I can be really, really honest about how I feel. And it ends well. That's like a very evolved person that can handle both sides. And I don't find that with women, it's often easy to recover after that. Yes. Oh, I'm having so many massive ahas when you're talking because a big roadblock in finding and creating meaningful friendships as you get older Mm -hmm. is the ick factor. I mean, it's ick. It is so ick for me to sit here and be like, I wish I had a friend. It is so ick to have a friend and to say, I wish we were better friends. It is so ick to be dissatisfied or hurt by a friend and to come to them only for them to turn around and be like, what are you talking about? I've just been busy. Sorry. And then all of a sudden now you feel like this really needy, creepy person. And it's like the last space. I don't know. That just, It, it hurts. Yeah. It hurts. I had that with a friend this year. Like I approached her and I was like, yo, I just felt like the last time you came to visit, she lives out of town. I was like, we were just, something felt like we weren't connecting. And I felt like you didn't, really want to hang out with me. And I was kind of just going into these stories of all these things. 
what I realized in my purse is that I was idolizing her again. You know, she was someone I didn't feel secure attachment with. So I was just kind of floundering. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? What do I have to do to make you love me? What do I have to do to make you want to hang out with me? Just like I do with my mom. What do I have to do to make you love me, to see me, to want to be with me, to spend time with me? I'll do anything. I'll change who I am, all these things. And so I kind of brought her into what was going on in my head a little bit. And it was so like the response was so, it wasn't mean, but it was just so like, oh, babe, I mean, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, that's not true. It just was kind of like flat. And I'm like, oh, that is not what I wanted. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, that is like, it didn't feel hard enough because when someone opens up to you vulnerably, especially to me, I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I just want to affirm that so much, even if it's hard. And I just was like, fuck, this is so embarrassing. I feel like I am so crazy and stupid and I shouldn't have done that and all of the things. But I'm like, you know what, whatever. Like, that's how I want to be in my life moving forward is I want to be able to say how I'm feeling. Yes. Like, I want to bring people on in my process. Like, it's better than just stuffing it all in and just being like, everything's great all the time. Because it's not. Mm -hmm. You know, but I think conflict resolution is very hard in friendships, especially females. Yeah, I'm even like reflecting on that scenario that you just told and being like, man, I can totally see both sides. Yeah. Because we've all been on both sides. Yes. We have been the person where somebody overanalyzed the situation. And totally. because your friends are really touch and go, especially as you get older, yes. they may not have full access to all that you're going through and experiencing. Yes. And so if they have space to think more into things mm -hmm. or to analyze why you didn't respond to a happy birthday text mm -hmm. and you just didn't, then for you, what is like a non-event can mm -hmm. be a very big event for them. I do agree with what you're saying though, it's in how that person responds back to you, yeah. lets you know a lot. Mm -hmm. But it is one of those things like uh, what you kind of said about you can't go back from it. Know, Cause that's the difficult thing of like yeah, this push and play dynamic of usually with dating, because there is a secondary motivation of sex, yes. there's a reason that brings us back together, mm -hmm. even if socially things are awkward. Mm -hmm. There's still sex that has to be tended to, or which family. then gives you a reason mm -hmm. to like, repair mm -hmm. the social awkwardness. Mm -hmm. If you have a socially awkward moment with a friend, there's no other reason to hit that person up again. So it just kind of sits and lingers. Dude, I know, that's, I have that with, I've probably had more relationships fail when things bring, are brought up than actually yeah. have succeeded, to be honest. And that Across happened. Across the board? I would say with females, um, yeah. I think in 2022, there was a few relationships where I was like, all right, I'm gonna fucking do this. I'm gonna bring up things, I'm gonna, talk about whatever, and it didn't fucking work. What's well, interesting listening to you talk mm -hmm. about these misfires or these awkward scenarios mm -hmm. that you've had last year with friends, I cannot relate to you at all. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't have that with anybody, mm -hmm. but I also don't have deep relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the uh, willingness to take these risks yes. and to put yourself in these positions for these awkward mm -hmm. scenarios that you reap the rewards. Yeah, rewards and then also you reap the heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And I think for you, <clears throat> you know, I'm curious about it's like a fear of intimacy a little bit. What would you, or yeah, would you, what's I can that? identify with that. I can, I mean, it's funny because when you say that, I like want to break down your walls and just love you. Oh, <laughs> I really do. I just want to be like, I'm going to change Let's her. Let's go to the club. I'm, literally. I'm like, I'm going to be, I'm going to change her life. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that there has to be some kind of fear of going <laughs> deep, trying or looking needy. There's got to be something there. Yeah. Like there, if I am not relating to you, like mm -hmm. I don't have anybody who I've ever had an awkward encounter with. It's because mm -hmm. I'm not brave enough yeah. to go to the person who I wanted to build a friendship with and be like, hey, I'd really like for us to spend time together. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy that we spent this much time mm -hmm. missing each other. Yeah. Can we really work on this? Can yes. we prioritize yes. this? I'm not going to do that. Mm. And that's the reason why mm. on a casual Saturday night, I'm mm. like, who do I talk to? I know. Well, it's interesting because in romance, you talk about dating a lot in romantic relationships. You have to put yourself out there. Oh, 100%. Right? I mean, this is the thing is like in my romantic relationship, I, uh -huh, I mean, a billion percent. I mean, it's just a very different feeling though. Like I'm accustomed to rejection and I have the, the callus for rejection and romantic love in a way that I don't have for friends. Mm. I wonder, do you have relationships where you feel like you've been rejected by women or your mom relationship? Do you ever feel like? No, I mean, yes and no, I can see that. I mean, I definitely have, I think from losing, I've had two losses, like as you were mentioning, the loss of friends yeah. being those huge heartbreaks. I have two huge friendship heartbreaks that I experienced in my 20s. And not that I like became avoidant after that. I think you just get busy, you move a lot, yeah. your circumstances change <laughs> and then I think I had friends at a time pre-COVID actually, I had a good group of friends. Like when I got married, we had a beautiful wedding yeah. surrounded by a lot of friends. 
some of those friends stopped <coughs> becoming friends and you had to pick a side. Yeah. Some of those friends moved and mm. some of those friends, you just didn't move in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So for various different reasons, like that group that when I first moved to LA and I was single and I was isolated, I really worked my ass off to yeah. build a group of friends and mm -hmm. I read the benefits of that. Which is interesting that as soon as I got married, I probably just stopped mm -hmm. trying, mm -hmm. really. Can I say there's like this equal mix of liberation and dread that oh come with God. this conversation? Because mm -hmm. I'm like, ah, oh, but I don't want to try. You don't <laughs> You're like, I want to sit in my castle because and have them all come to me. You also picture the times that you don't have available that your phone rings and you have to look oh God, and feel babe. guilt. What do you mean? And be like, ah, oh, I don't Dude, have the space. That's the thing, the phones, it's like, and my fucking phone all the time, I'm like, I have a job replying to all you fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, God damn it. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I got to take 30 minutes to reply. It's a real ass job. We had this on the calendar and this has been scheduled like 50 times. 50. Yeah. 50. This is a real job I sent with the, assistance in tow. I know. I sent the calendar invite to the wrong email. Um, but yeah, it's like You're a not whole, good at your job, but it's a I job. Know, it was it's my first calendar. But yeah, it's a whole job to maintain relationships and connections. And I think social media, well, not social media, but I think the world that we're in has made it even harder because for an example, you know, we have like very loose relationships with tons of people in our space and industry. And even if we were not in our industry, people that are listening, you know, they have tons of relationships with people that they probably wouldn't have had if we didn't have social media. Yeah. Cause now you can connect with your people from high school, from college, from people all over the world. So it's making it really hard to discern and understand like who's an actual fucking friend that's going to show up for you and who's just someone that you like, right yaz underneath their Instagram photo for. So I think building a conscious friendship, you know, which is what we're doing. Mm. Um, it's interesting because you don't want to like say too much and be like, I have anxious attachment style because you want to let like, like I want to meet you where you are and I want to see what we have energetically together. Oh, my you know what I mean? was inside my jacket the whole time. It was really embarrassing. Let's start again. Okay. It was <laughs> really embarrassing. Awful. I was just realizing I'm like, why do I feel like a hunchback? Like, I just feel very... <laughs> Popping in for the ad break right quick. Ritual and Symbiotic have created a prebiotic, postbiotic, probiotic that is here to help you balance your gut microbiome. Now I have been a user of Ritual for maybe three years now. I used it as my prenatal for Ryu. That was how I got started and I am obsessed. First and foremost, they're just beautifully formulated tablets that never make you feel sick, that are easy to take and they are fun to take if I'm being honest with you. And now that I have switched over to this formula, I can say that I have noticed a difference. And that's why I'm happy to bring in the postbiotic to my daily multivitamin family. I have made a devotion to myself this year to really prioritize my health and truly that begins with the gut. Daily three-in-one prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic with two of the world's most clinically studied probiotic strains to support the relief of mild and occasional bloating, gas, and diarrhea. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual want you to celebrate, not hide your insides. So there's no more shame in your gut game. And that is why they are offering listeners of Lovers and Friends, the podcast, 10% off their order for three months. So you, all you do is go to ritual.com slash lovers for 10% off. And of course, if you'd like, please add Symbiotic Plus if you have an existing order with Ritual. Once again, that is ritual.com slash lovers. I feel half hopeful and half dreadful about that because I often, when I talk to single people, mm -hmm. think to myself, as much as it sucks to be in your position where you're constantly checking your phone. And yes. Every time you go, I remember when you're single, you go to the club or anywhere. Oh my God. You're like, is this my person? Is that my person? Dude. You have to be on the prowl. That's it's a grocery store. And you're like, is that him? Yeah. <laughs> you're like on the treadmill. You're like, is he next to me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, and my psychic shit. said he was going to be tall. <laughs> This shit is tiring. It's, it's, uh, it's, and that it's phone wrong. shit Yo. where every time your phone rings, Yo. your whole entire stomach drops to your toes. Mm -mm. Like that is It's wild awful. too because you're like, you know what? We're fucking done. I knew it. I knew, I knew it. it. And then they text you. You're like, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting married. Oh, no, we're on the same page. <laughs> I was thinking of, you know, when you're like in your early dating phase and that person calls you and you're like, am I in a cool enough environment to oh, answer? 100%. It's Friday night and I'm at home by myself mm -hmm. watching Stranger Things. Yes. Am I too old to be watching this? Yes. How do I answer this call? And they say, you what like are you puts, doing? I uh, like a CD on. You're like, hey! Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I don't have that in a romantic relationship. 
And I sometimes yearn for that again. God, yeah. Because it is, that's a point of being alive. Totally. Those icky, uncomfortable feelings. Yes. That putting yourself out there, the gambling, yes. the trying, the gain and the loss. And what so- if it's like the adrenaline? The adrenaline of yeah. it. There's mm -hmm. something just- it's like the brain chemicals. Mm -hmm. There's some, it inspires so much art. Mm -hmm. I wrote incredible short stories. Mm -hmm. I made poetry pants. I did mm -hmm. crazy things when I was in that phase of mm -hmm. my life of trying to find love and losing. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to invite that in my romantic life because I love what I have with Jared, but maybe it's time for me to invite some of that angst, yes. which I have been purposefully avoiding yes. in a friendship capacity. Yes, because then you like when it hits, you're like, fuck yeah, yeah. this feels good. Like to be seen and loved by someone, you're like, this feels fucking good. I mean, that stress, like, because I have it so much, I'm like, it's not fun. But it's something that is more internal for me. And it's just nice when I have the stress and then I'm met. Can you do a like, hi, I'm Krista, you can follow that thing, you know? Yeah. Hi, I'm Krista Williams from Almost 30. You can follow me at It's Krista on Instagram. That's K R I S T A. That's it. You don't wanna do more? Yeah, you could also buy all my products, subscribe to everything that I've ever done, and send me money on Venmo. <laughs> <laughs> Krista Dash Williams, cashing out. You know when you're on a panel and the person before you answers a question so well that all there's left for you to say afterwards is, yeah, what they just said. That's exactly how I feel with that entire interview with Krista. What she just said, I second all of it, including her calls to action in the end. I highly recommend that you follow her on Instagram and listen to her podcast, Almost 30. Two things that I benefit from, and I invite you to invite more Krista into your life to benefit from that too. And speaking of invitations, let's move on to the ghost of Christmas past this episode, Tavia Charles. Tabia is an Olympian. She is a mom of two. She is a wife. She is an entrepreneur. She is a real estate agent. Um, she owns multiple properties, is one of the busiest, most productive people that I know. And in addition to that, she is a coach both for children and also for adults and women. She is somebody who creates intentional spaces for women to find their potential and find each other whether that be through workout classes or through talking events um, or through empowerment events, empowering women to get into real estate. I've just literally seen her do it all and I can't think of a better person to invite on to talk about how to do it. How do you make friends in your 30s and beyond? And Tabia has really mastered that. And on a personal note, Tabia is my ex-best friend. So let's get into it. But also, I really, really, really need you to hear this right now because I didn't have time at the end because Camille comes back in in the conclusion. So I forgot to mention the calls to action for Tabia. I highly recommend while you're following Krista, do yourself a favor. Also look up Tavia Charles on Instagram. Trust me, after you hear this interview, you'll definitely come back and be like, what was her Instagram again? Because I definitely want to follow her. It's at Tavia Charles. Tell everybody about our friendship origin story. Oh my gosh. So we ha it's been like 25 plus years. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to remember exactly the day and the time, but we played soccer together. So we played for rowdies. I feel like that is the first time we fell in love with each other. I guess in my mind, because soccer times, you were so much more popular. And Shannon is not adored. true. <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> Yes. So I felt like I was like not at your level, but that is, um, that when I think the about soccer, farthest thing from the truth, Shan. Let's just be honest. You're way better at soccer than me. I was pretty good. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. And then let's also be honest. You're actually way more liked than me. That, well, so, well, this is the thing. I don't know if it's, a, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of being way more liked, you know, it's, I'm just super friendly. You know this, like what I admire about you is that you're a straight shooter you're no nonsense. I mean, you're not with the shits. And so I just have a little higher tolerance for people. And that's what it is. I, I'm so, I mean, I, I say this all the time and I'm going to say it now because it's being recorded, but I'm like so in awe of you. I'm so in love with your life. I'm so happy for everything that you have. Listen, let me tell you something. Do you know that one of your, so I always tell people like when I talk about you, I mean, of course, like we're, we have different worlds now. You're in LA, we have different friends, but like we always like come back and find the love and all those things. One of your greatest qualities is that I've never seen you to be a jealous person. You, even if you're feeling uncomfortable or, or you're feeling a way about how somebody treated you or, you know, or how somebody is using their gifts or, 
you know, whatever it is, you are the most, one of the most, I would say you and my other friend, Tammy, never, never showing jealousy. You show nothing but love. I don't know if you ever remember, but I mean, you know, we're in a time, I'm dark skin, you're light skin, but whatever. And Shan, like growing up, you know that I never had, I never had any insecurity issues about being a dark skin girl because the amount of love you used to, like I could get emotional just talking about it right now, but like the love that you used to like pour into me all the time. Oh my God, like, like you used to tell me all the time, Tammy, you're so beautiful. Like you would say things like, even like downplay yourself and be like, Tabby, people are because I'm light skinned. I'm like, Shannon, don't say that. You're like, Tabby, you're so gorgeous. You're so beautiful. Tabba, at first and foremost, like, how beautiful. And secondly, I probably haven't seen anybody who's as attractive as you. Oh, yes. um, I mean that not just like in the physical beauty sense. I mean, beyond that, there is something so deeply attractive about you. People are really drawn to you, which actually brings me to what I wanted to talk to you about in the main chunk of this because. I need to find a word to say this because I'm not a jealous person, but I am definitely somebody who looks at other people and thinks, I wish I had that. Um, sometimes I can make those wishes yeah. and then be like, but I'm not willing to put the work in. And I, I'm good at that, of being like, man, that person's career is amazing, but I know what they were willing to do to get, the, yes. get that. And I don't have the space or I'm not willing to do that. So good for them. And I wish I had it. But also I know that it never would be for me. But your friendships... Your network of friends, the way that you've been able to keep and maintain friendships despite having two kids in your 30s, um, it's just, I don't have anything like that. And I really just want to know how you do it. Oh my gosh, Shannon, let me tell you something. Like when I tell you that the love and adoration that I have for my friends, like sometimes I'm just, sometimes I'm sad that you're so far away in LA because the way that I would love to spoil you and to be around you and to let you go out and do your thing while I take care of your kids because this is what I get from my girlfriends. Literally, Shannon, I feel like I have sister wives. Like if I had like if I was a millionaire or when I become a millionaire, I would like I would legit customize a huge house that like my girls could have their different quarters and we all just live together. We raise our kids together. This space in my life now for like the past five, six, seven plus years. Um, oh, the friendships are just so beautiful. Um, Shannon, I can go away for a weekend and my friends are like, Tab, like, just bring your kids over here um, or I'll come to your house and I'll watch them. Um, I've never had to say no to doing anything with my husband, with my family, um, because they are always offering up, Tabby, like, you go, like, go, go relax, um, go do a spa. And I legit wish what I have with my girlfriends for everybody. I think what the universe has actually given me is like the richness of my friends, the richness of love. I don't even know. I, I could go on and on and on and on and on about it. It's just maybe like luck. I don't know if it's luck that I've, that I've had luck or, you know, what it is. But yeah, it's something truly special. Well, I'm hoping it's more than luck because I wanted your advice because I genuinely would call we're obviously friends and I think that our relationship I think we're going to be in a season coming up next of reconnecting more in an intimate way because I feel That's like for the past few years we've been ceremonial friends well, where 100%. it's like the idea of friendship yes. exists between us but the act of friendship isn't really there I agree and I can obviously say that I'm the problem in this because if we looked at the proof in the pudding I am somebody who does not have friends this year is a year that I'm trying to fix that. But I will be honest with you. I I don't know. It's not that I don't know if I know how to, but I kind of feel like a fuck boyfriend. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain this properly, but like I want friendship, but I'm like afraid of the work that the work that goes goes into actually cultivating the friendships. So I'm saying it out loud. Like I said to my friend yesterday, I was like, I really want to be friends with you. And then she texted me something about a trip. And I'm like, oh, this feels overwhelming. I never responded to her. She's like, what? what? Problem. Like, so. <laughs> so, Shannon, I'll, I'll be, I'll keep it 100% real, right? So I, I truly believe that, like, the energy that we give out in anything, like, as you know, like, you are so damn successful. You have abundance because of what you put into your work, right? So that same energy that you put into, like, your family, to your husband, to like getting to where you want to get to, to going back to school. 
I put that same type of energy like into my friends. I like literally get off Shannon on like hosting my girls when they come over, you know, like sending them to the spa to get a massage, um, cooking for them. And I know that this is tricky. This is a real thing for me because I can feel the difference in my body and my reaction. Because when you were describing your friends pouring into you, your friends taking your kids, giving you a break, never having to say no to your husband. Like, those are not my realities. Like, I always have too little. And I, I, I like, had a really hard year last year with being pregnant because I needed so much and there wasn't a lot of people around for me. Um, maybe because I didn't cultivate those relationships or just, you know, the, the timing of the people that I traditionally went to, it just... They didn't have the space for me. But when you're describing that part, I was like getting teary eyed and I was just feeling like, wow, I want that. And then when you were talking in reverse about having to give and host and send people away on trips and talk when you don't want to talk, then I was like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing, though. I mean, you also can't force what is not, so in this case, so it's twofold. One thing about you, right? I mean, you're not giving yourself enough credit because there's t you're busy as hell. And I'm busy, but we all, we all prioritize things very differently. But Shan, you have come down here for like appearances, okay? And you always, every single time you come down, you organize an event because you don't have time to see everybody individually. Every single time you come down here, you organize an event, whether at your place, whether at a dinner, whether at Atlanta's house just the other week, to bring all of your friends together. So you can't say that you don't put in the effort. You went and bought mad toys for everybody's children to take with them. So you're not giving yourself enough credit for what you are able to do within the capacity that you can. So maybe it really is a matter of you just kind of literally just taking time to spend those time with people. Because if you are hesitant, Maybe other people are also feeling that energy from you. You get what I'm saying? Like, my advice is put out the exact same energy you want to get back. Shannon, I'm super friendly because I want people to be friendly to me. I hold doors for people because I want people to hold doors for me. I'm kind. I love to compliment women, make them feel beautiful because I would love that same energy towards me. Put yourself in spaces to meet women. Um, nothing's worse than when I hear things like, oh, I don't have much girlfriends. You know, I don't really hang out with girls. And I love being around women. Go to more women's events. Like there's women there who are super shy, who are feeling the same way that you're feeling. And they want to be out there. They want to be here. Um, they, they want that same type of sisterhood that I have with my girlfriends. And you'd be surprised. Some of my bestest and closest friends that I've met were from boot camp. I make people truly like see how magical they are. And in turn, it's like they are now feeling comfortable and confident in our relationships and friendships. And I think that's that is how you build a beautiful sisterhood. Drake has that song, No New Friends. What's your take on that? Oh, my gosh. New friends all the time. It's like, I mean, you don't have to go out there like begging friends. But, you know, when you meet beautiful people and, you know, you vibe with them, you know, invite them into your space. Why not? Because new friends can take you to places you have never been before i'm all about new friends always old friends new friends friends that i didn't fuck with for a long time and they come back into my life and you know we rekindle a, a relationship so i'm just about good vibes good people good vibrations good connections see even the fact that you could say all this so arms wide open because i would be afraid to say this out loud in thinking that people would hear this and then call me and be like let's do stuff <laughs> or people, you know what but I mean? Not, like, but Shannon, though, but isn't that what you, but don't you want to be, you just told me that you want to be able to say, I had a great weekend last, last week. So how can you do that if you're not honest in like what you want in your friendships? How can you have a great weekend last week, but you don't have the energy to hang out with people? That, how, how is that possible? I feel like the moral of the story is be less like me and more like her. That's how you make friends in your 30s. A hundred percent. Welcome back, Camille. Glad to be here. So there are people who are watching the, or listening to this episode and are asking, how do I make friends in my adult years? How do I start lifelong friendships after I've already done a lot of living? Mm -hmm. What's the answer? 
Oh, I think that part of it is really getting to know yourself first. I think that when it comes to starting new friendships, figuring out what actually makes you happy is a really good place to start because I think that in addition to friendships, we also forget about hobbies and interests when we get older. And if you pay attention to what kind of things you like to do, that's a good jumping off point for the people that you will meet. Also, part of it is knowing that creating friendships similarly to starting a romantic relationship requires vulnerability, right? It requires us to be like, so I'm trying to be your friend. Like, what does that mean? Are you down? Like, what are you, you know, I think that it's like really just trying to feel somebody out and knowing that it is okay if somebody isn't in a place where they're looking for shared friendship. I love throughout our conversation with each other, you have really built in back doors for this not being the only way to live. Yeah, yeah. And I want to expand on that more with you. Like, does everybody need to have friends? I, you know, I really don't think that you need to. Like, I think that I try to not speak in absolutes as much as possible. Do I think that friendships enrich your life? Yeah, I do. Do I think that there are multiple ways to have relationships with other human beings and with yourself? Absolutely. And so I think that there can be some kind of stigma if you don't have like this abundance of friends. And I don't think that you need to. I don't think that that is for everyone. I don't think that that feels authentic to everyone. I don't think that that feels safe for everyone. And so I think that if you have relationships like with a sibling, why does that not get to be the primary friendship in your life? And I think that that's such a powerful, I mean, like the arc of what you just talked about in that conversation is so interesting because you're like, yes, that sounds so good. And we want to be cared for, I think, in our essence. And I think that it's also like, whoa, to imagine being like, I'm going to take care of your kids, go to spa you like, I'm not worried about my kids. Like, please, no, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And I think that it is okay. Like, to be exactly where you are makes sense. And it also, sometimes I think that we can develop friendships that feel more unidirectional. Um, as long as, it, like, I think that it's like a big part of consent. Like, I have a lot of friends that, because I'm a therapist, like, they'll either be like, so I can talk to you about everything, or... I'm not going to talk to you about this. I'm going to unload with somebody else. And so they will let me unload onto them. And yeah. so I think that it's, and we we talk about that, right? Like not in like a let's decide what type of friendship we want to have, but just be like they'll start talking and be like, oh, girl, I'm sorry. You probably like had a heavy client day. Um, How are you? And then I'll be like, oh, my God, you're right. And then I'm like unloading onto them. And then I sometimes don't have the capacity to be like, but what were you going to say? Sometimes I'm like, cool, thanks, bye. And I think that it is okay because there has been this kind of like implicit conversation where we consent to that type of relationship. So I think that, and those things change and ebb and flow over time as well. And I wanted to offer this as a point for other people because people who are drawn to this episode may be, draw, may be doing so because of the reasons that I'm at. Yeah. They're not where yeah. you're at. You know what I mean? If they have not multiple friends, they're like, I'm scrolling past this one. I'm all good on this front. But it's the people who are like, oh, I resonate with the idea of not. I think asking yourself the questions underneath that because it's like relationships. I think that we actually had a beautiful thing happen during the pandemic. And Bumble had this term called consciously single. And that was people who were like, yeah, I'm single, but not like, don't feel bad for yeah. me. Yeah. Not, this is not in circumstance. Yeah. Not like bad series of events I'm single it's like mm -hmm. I am consciously choosing this state for myself and I genuinely believe that being alone and unpartnered right now is the best thing for me period and so because we don't have you know a thing for that for friendships the idea is if you don't have friends and you're not living optimally yeah um, and maybe that's not the case for everybody I agree yeah I think that's really well said of like you have a lot of relationships and things that demand your time like, it's okay that that is where your focus is and that's what you pour into. And it doesn't have to be, like, anybody pitying you or being like, well, if you just change this and if you just do this differently, then you can have friendships because that is what everybody wants. Everybody has this status. That's not the case for everyone, similarly to relationships. Of if you just try this, then you can find um, a marriage, a spouse. And then if you just did this and you can have kids, and that can be the case that some people want that. And for some people, that doesn't have to be anywhere near their aspirational goals. So I think that extending that same grace across the board could be really helpful. Camille, such a joy. I'm so glad that I had you. Me too. Uh, 
And please tell people where they can find you and get more of you. Yeah, you can find me at Camille Lewis, K-A-M-I-L Lewis on Instagram. Also, my podcast, Safe Word, is Safe Word Pod on Instagram. And me and another sex therapist talk about queer dating, relationships, sex, and gender. And if you're looking for a therapist, I run a private practice called The Expansive Group. And we are always looking for new clients to support. Hi. It's just us again, as promised, and I want to share with you what this all meant for me. How did all this information from these incredible voices and perspectives net out for me? And I want to share this with you in hopes that it unlocks some epiphanies for you as you reflect on this topic. So I began this episode identifying a need and then setting a goal for myself. I need friends, and by this time next year, I want to say I have a group of really, really great friends or one really, really great and connected friend. And as I made it, and as you could sort of see as I was listening to people, what I realized is that that may not happen for me in that precise way. I was actually re-listening to an episode that I did about dating in your 20s because it recently went viral or had a resurgence because Perfect Match star Georgia Hazarati was on that episode. And if you watched Perfect Match, you'd understand why, because she's on the episode with Harry Jowsey. So... Lots of tea, lots of drama in the mix of that. And that meant that it re-sparked up on YouTube and then consequently on podcasts as well. People were re-listening to that episode. And so I re-listened and there was something that I said in that episode that I was like, oh, I'm talking to myself right here. You want to take the benefits of relationships, but you don't want to give up what is traditionally required to be in one. You want access to sex. You want somebody good looking that you're attracted to, to do cool stuff with. And you probably want someone in your corner, someone to be there for you during this decade, which is stressful, where many things are in flux. But you don't want the abilities that come with that the responsibility to that other person's feelings, the accountability to that person's expectations of you, and the agreeability, meaning the ability to put somebody else's happiness and needs over your own at times. And as a result of these two different worlds and different needs, what a lot of people end up doing is dating in their 20s, but in really shitty ways. And so I was gonna end this by saying, point blank period I'm not going to focus on friendships right now because I simply just can't and ultimately don't really want to but that didn't really feel right or actually true to my reality because even in just starting these conversations I feel like I have started to build more friendships however I am making friendships with an acknowledgement that it is not in my top three priorities and I have to be clear with people that I am creating bonds with that that is my truth my top priority is my children, my husband, and work, and then my family, and then my me time, um, and then my house. Like there's a lot of things that come before the space where I'm like, oh yeah, and now hang out with a friend, school, another one for me. So that to be said, I am now cultivating friendships that I'm very clear about where they lie in terms of my priorities. I actually have attempted to do this with several people. It hasn't worked out with everybody. I had somebody who actually kind of abruptly left. They were hanging out with me. Both my kids were crying. I was pumping milk. They're like, I think I should go now. And I have to be comfortable with that rejection because the way that I'm asking people to be friends with me is not all the way, one, as they would traditionally see it, or two, in their favor. And so I have to be okay with people opting out. So that's where I'm currently at with friendships, trying to build dynamics within the capacity that I have while being upfront about what I don't. And I'm gonna keep you updated on how this journey is gonna go for me. For example, I actually went out with Krista. Okay, I'm out with Krizia. This is for the friendship episode. You just said my name's Krizia. (laughs) What are we doing? (laughs) And we're obviously not friends. We're not any closer at all. It's for failing. (laughs) I'm out with Krista. That is the end of this episode. Hopefully next week we'll be back with the Becky G interview. But I do hope that this episode takes you to the rate and review podcast section. How did you feel? What did you think? What were your epiphanies? How did this relate to your life? I am going to read out some of the best reflections that you have had from this episode on the next episode. So please Make it your personal diary. I cannot wait to connect with you in this way and hear what came up for you. Until then, have a great week.
Lovers and Friends is executive produced by Shared Entertainment's Shan Boudram. It is produced by Boudram and Crizia Cruz with production support from 2S Entertainment's Adam Krasner and Brianna Barone. The Lovers and Friends theme song is produced by Sean Ross and performed by Jared Brady, who also does the scoring and engineering on our episodes. Lovers and Friends is powered by Audio Boom and made possible by our incredible sponsors who you can show love to by reading our show notes.